Welcome to Most of Minutia. I'm Colleen Lindell. This is Episode 9, Stephanie Beatrice. Well, guys, this week I count myself very fortunate. I got to sit down with the beautiful, the kind, the muy inteligente, the joyful Stephanie Beatrice. You guys might know her as super badass Detective Rosa Diaz on hit Fox show Brooklyn Nine-Nine. In this episode, we do talk about Brooklyn Nine-Nine a bit. We also talk about the roses Steph knows in her real life, how she maintains her health and keeps a balance in her life, and her recent role on the new Pee Wee Herman movie, Pee Wee's Big Holiday, which is due out this spring and I can't wait. But first and foremost, we talk about live theater, most specifically Hamilton the Musical, which is currently on Broadway and changing the scope of theater. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation. When I was thinking about like where to start talking with you, I was like, there's so many questions that I have for her. Um, I don't really know what the, you know, the so best many beginning questions. is. Yes, yeah, so many That's questions. Funny. But then I I was like, you know what? I'm just going to start with Hamilton. Oh, great. I like that. Yeah, because that's what kind of drew us together. Hamilton. Yeah. It's so good. I can't stop singing it all the time. I'm singing it all the time. <laughs> like, look at my face right now. I'm like, nah. yeah. I you listen are to glowing. it in the car. I listen to it like constantly, constantly. It's everything. I love it. I love it so much. So I think I should get the soundtrack. Yeah, you should get it. Everyone in, on the planet should have it. And it should be like required <laughs> for every human being ever. <laughs> I wish that like I just read something that they're I don't I can't remember what organization. Maybe you can look it up later. But they're subsidizing buying tickets for it for New York high school students like students in the public high school program. Perfect. And they only have to pay $10 in Alexander Hamilton to go. Oh my god! And like, so there's going to be student matinees of kids in the New York public school system that are seeing this thing filled with actors that like look like everyone. There's all sorts of actors, white, black, Asian, like, like they're going to look up on that stage and see people doing musical theater that mm-hmm. look like them and that sound like them. Like there's so many hip hop influences within the musical, but at the same time, it's absolutely sticking to the traditional sort of um, influences and themes and and structure that American musical theater has always had. And it's like straight up history class. It's awesome. I mean, there's some little, there's like little <laughs> tweaks and stuff that he had to do. The author, Lin-Manuel Miranda, actually worked really closely with, because uh, I nerded out and like Googled a bunch of stuff afterwards. So he, he wanted to stay as true as possible. Mm-hmm. But there are some things that just like for story and time that he had to sort of tweak. But there are things I didn't know. I mean, like you hear like the number 1776 and you go like, great, that's when we got our independence. We're all good. Yeah. But like yeah. really it didn't happen until the Battle of Yorktown, which was 1781, which I didn't even know happened. You know, you just don't really learn about it. You just go, yep, we're independent and we're free. Yay. Mm-hmm. And that Thomas Jefferson was kind of a douche. Like, you don't hear that ever yeah. because because you hear, like, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. But meanwhile, like, he didn't fight in the war at all and was over in France just, like, chilling, being hmm. ambassador to, to France. Mm-hmm. He was all the way in France? Yeah, man. He didn't even fight. Yeah. Embarrassing. Super embarrassing. <laughs> um, also, there's that whole thing with, like, uh, owning slaves. <laughs> right. Owning lots of slaves. Um, there was that. There's this great part in the musical where they're having a, um, a meeting in Congress. Mm-hmm. And it's set up like a rap battle. It's awesome. It's like two MCs rapping. Gosh. So Jefferson and Hamilton go to, to town right and it's about whether or not states in the new union should be taxed oh no it's about whether or not like the the union should take on the state's debts Mm -hmm. right which for jefferson would be not great because like virginia doesn't have any debt Mm mm-hmm because right. they, they're rich because they don't pay their for labor because right. they own <laughs> slaves, right? Like, whereas, like, in the North, in New York, Hamilton's, like, arguing that, like, it will only, like, give a boost to the economy. Like, we should do it, you know, and there's, like, this... I mean, and the fact that it's couched within a rap battle with, like, two MCs, the thing that I've been yeah. singing over and over is after they battle, Jefferson's, like, singing with... I can't remember the other character's name, but he's... <laughs> It's right after the battle, and he goes, "You don't have the votes, ah, ha 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 ha. You're gonna need congressional approval, and you don't have the votes. It's so great. 
Because it's such an amazing way to sort of like exactly tell you what's going going on through story Mm -hmm. with sound, you know? And like, that's what hip hop does. Yeah. And so many young people can connect to that. Is the whole thing hip hop? No, that's the thing. And they're not marketing as a, as a hip hop musical, which I think is so smart. Yeah, because I, I was doing a bit, just a s- small amount of research. Yeah. And I didn't read that at no. all. And then I was like, but from her post, from right. your post. It sounds was, like that. Yeah. Well, I think that that's brilliant because I think it would alienate a lot of ticker buyers. I mean, if you think like... But I love hip hop. Right. Like... Lots of people do. <sighs> but think about like, maybe think about like a family that's visiting New York for the first time. Right. And they're say they've saved all this money for their trip, right? Mm-hmm. And they want to see like a really good show and they want to make sure they're going to get their bang for their buck. Like, so it's between like what Hamilton, which is a hip hop musical question mark, mm-hmm. or this other thing over here that looks like sort of traditional and like they'll have a good time. If the marketing materials don't tell you that it's a hip hop musical, if they just say... It's this amazing musical that's like getting all this hubbub. Beyonce went and saw it. And it's about America. It's about the founding fathers. Then you go, oh, that sounds good. That sounds like a safe bet. Mm-hmm. you know. And that gets more butts in the seats, which mm-hmm. is absolutely brilliant, I think. And you you have a friend that's currently starring in Well, it, Lynn. Like- yeah, Lynn and I were friends. We met through a playwright who actually – so Lynn Manuel Miranda wrote In the Heights, which was a musical a few years back that won – a Tony Award for Best Musical, and he wrote the music and lyrics for it, and then my friend Kiara Alegria Hudes, who's a playwright, she wrote the book for the musical. Okay. And she is an amazing, amazing playwright. She won a Pulitzer. She's fantastic. She She's one of my favorite playwrights ever because she does this like incredible thing where in a lot of Latino quote, there are air quotes around that, a lot of Latino um, writers in playwrights um have elements of what's called you know magical realism Mm -hmm. right and so like what what can happen is that sometimes people can sort of just go like oh that's what they do you know latino writers do magical realism i'm not interested in producing that kind of play so i don't want to do that Mm -hmm. kiara has this majestic touch with it that sort of makes it like she drops it in as Mm. just a sort of element of the play itself like moving action forward Mm -hmm. so it doesn't ever feel like it's some weird thing that's coming out of nowhere it just feels totally organic and awesome Mm -hmm. like of course this is supposed to happen yes and (laughs) and that like oh the play wouldn't work without that amazing Mm -hmm. cool moment of like flashing back or moving forward in time or like time slowing down or something right Mm -hmm. and really that's just it's not a a quote unquote Latino thing. That's what plays, plays have always done that kind of thing. You know, like you think about, I mean, American musical theater is a perfect example. Carousel. There's that whole dream ballet in the middle of Carousel. Or is it Carousel? Or No, it's Oklahoma. I think it's Oklahoma. But there's like a dream ballet in the middle of it where like suddenly the story starts getting told in in dance right and that's you could call that magical realism if yeah you really, if you really wanted to get into it yeah. like you know so anyway so she introduced me to lynn a long time ago um and i went and saw lynn has a group called freestyle love supreme is that spoken word it's like rap spoken word but like also just insanity like i want to see that they would take <laughs> suggestions from the audience and then freestyle like stories about it so it was kind of like whose line is it anyway, Mm -hmm. in a way, it was incredible because, I mean, the thing that you don't get from watching Hamilton is that Lynn is like one of the most gifted freestyle artists like ever. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Like the stuff that comes out of his mouth, you're just like, how did you not write that beforehand? Like you just really just thought that up just now? You're lying. (laughs) You're full of it. Um, And it's like your story. Yeah. The story of your life. (laughs) Yeah. Like you told him like four, four like facts about yourself and then he's like weave them into this like crazy thing. It's nuts. He's nuts. So yeah, we met, um, I think we maybe like went on one or two dates or something. And Was that when you were living in New York? That was when I was living in New York. Yeah. Your whole background is theater, right? Yeah. I studied theater. Like I went to college and like was like, I want to be a stage actress. Like that's what I wanted to do. Did you do that growing up too? No, I did. I, I think I started in speech and debate when I was like maybe eighth grade, mostly because there were only three electives. There were only three arts electives. Um, wait, wait, where were you? I was. Up? I grew up in Webster, Texas, which is a little town outside of Houston. Okay, so it's, they had three electives. Yeah, because... it was like you can do. At the time, it was like you could do choir, you could do art classes, or you could do speech and de- speech and debate. 
and I started in choir. Like I signed up for choir and like the first day of choir, she, the choir director was like, you can't really sing. So you might want to think about changing your elective. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and I was crushed. Just told you Horrible. That. Horrible. Who tells a child that? Not even like. We can do something with your voice. No, not even like lessons. nothing. Not 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 even like I'm so glad you're trying. Or, like nothing. That's it was just like That's yeah, not- it was horrifying. So obviously, like I immediately changed because I was like, she doesn't want me to be here. So then I started doing drama, speech and debate classes, and like it's sort of the the story that I really like to tell is that we did two plays every year. We had one in the fall and then one in the spring. The fall was like a Christmassy play. Mm-hmm. And one in the spring was like a, a melodrama called Idaho, the potatoes, but they just won't grow. <laughs> it was about Idaho and this family called the taters, the po, the po, the po taters. They were very poor. It was horrible. It was so stupid, but there was a, there was an ingenue role in it and I really wanted it. And I would like, went all out for it like we auditioned and everything and I did not get the ingenue role I went Hmm. to Cassie who was a very popular very pretty not very nice girl Hmm. um I instead got the villain who was a man yeah Um, I had short hair and my teeth were very crooked and that did like nothing for my self-esteem I was like cool I guess I'm like a monster um but then we started rehearsals and it was pretty fun and then when we got into like when we actually started doing dress rehearsals, I was like making people laugh. Mm. I was wearing this big handlebar mustache, black pants, a white long sleeve shirt and a top hat. And I looked like a dude cause like <laughs> I wasn't wearing any makeup and you know, like mm-hmm. at that, at that time in your life, like if you're an awkward teenage girl, a lot of times you look like an awkward teenage boy, especially if you have short hair. Yeah. Why was your hair so short? Did you my, cut it that my way? My mother cut it all off because she was very uncontrollable and hard for her to do. So she took me to go get it cut really short. <laughs> Yes. Yes, girl. Yes. <laughs> how, how old were you? I was 12. Oh, no. Like right when you're getting your like identity yes. sort of straight. Yes. I, w- I was a you're real like mess. You becoming a young woman. No. This and was like, I, am I a monster? Like, am I like, I think that's a lot of, I mean, I embraced the short hair later. I kept it short all through high school and I started cutting it like very punk rock Mm -hmm. like very spiky and cool and I think like what happened was for me what happened was you don't belong you look weird so (laughs) okay I'm gonna find myself in the weirdness then Mm -hmm. you know like if you if you think I don't belong and like that I look weird fine then I am a weirdo do you remember consciously thinking like that I think it started kind of like at the end of junior high because I started like gravitating toward like weird clothes, like bell bottoms. And like, I remember owning a pair of bell bottoms in eighth grade and everyone was like, what are you doing? <laughs> no. Because I had spent so long trying to fit in, like trying to look like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it just didn't, it just wasn't the right fit. I mean, I even, I even was on drill team for a while, which drill team in Texas is like, do you, have you ever heard of the Kilgore Rangerettes? No. They're this amazing drill team. They wear these little cowboy hats and like cute little uniforms and little dance boots and they dance at halftime during bat- football games. So almost every high school in Texas has a drill team. It's sort of like dance. It's, there's nothing, there's no flags or anything. But it's like a dance team for halftime at, at football games. And if you can make it onto cheerleading squad in high school, like you're solid. You're definitely going to be popular. Hmm. If you can make it onto drill team, like you're doing all right. Like you probably have like a decent group of friends and like you'll bond with the other girls on drill team. And I made it onto drill team and my mother was so happy Mm. because to her it meant like, oh yes, we've succeeded. We've assimilated. She's Uh going to be all right. She's Uh got friends. She might be popular. (laughs) And then in the middle of high school, I sort of figured out that that wasn't, those were not my people. Like there was a lot of like drinking going on. There was a lot of like sex happening and I just wasn't really interested in doing that at that time like I just Mm -hmm. it just seemed too overwhelming to me and like and and then the theater crowd seemed so cool they just were so accepting and so cool and but aren't they the coolest I mean I thought they were the coolest they always seem like they have the most fun they were having the most fun they weren't the most popular Mm -hmm. but when I sort of decided to quit drill team and just do theater my mom like was so mad at me she didn't talk to me for almost like three days so you had to quit drill team there's I no way that quit. you could have yeah well the... but were you also dancing too like normally like were you taking dance classes yeah and... on drill team you would have 
rehearsal, you would have practice every day after school for at least like four hours. So okay. it ate up like a lot of your life because you were dancing every week. You're at the football game during basketball season. You would dance at the basketball games. And then in the spring, you would have something called spring show, which was like all these different dances. Were you in ballet? No, I wasn't in ballet. It was just more like jazz and funk okay. and stuff, lyrical, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But there was no time to do both because I was also cast, uh, sophomore year I was cast in Godspell. Oh. And there was just no time to do both things. And so I decided in the middle of that, I was like, okay, I have to quit drill team to do this thing because this thing is bringing me so much joy. Like, yeah. I was just having such a good time. And I had a crush on a boy that was also like in <laughs> in the theater department. So I was very into him. Um. Yeah, so I had to like, I kind of had to make a decision. I Sometimes I wonder like what would have happened if I had tried to do both, you know? But mm-hmm. I don't think, it just wouldn't have shaken out the right way. Because mm-hmm. like immediately after I quit Joel Team, I got cast as Joe in Little Women. Wow. Yeah, and that was like the first big role that I'd ever had. And it was colorblind casting at the time, which I didn't really think too much about. But like the rest of the girls in the, in the family were white girls. And Joe, myself, was a Latina. And the woman that was playing, the girl that was playing the older Joe, who was like the narrator, was also white. Hmm. To me, that was the first time it was like, oh, yeah, you can do you could do anything you want, like anything. You're not going to be limited by this at all. Mm-hmm. Like, and that felt really good. Yeah, I was wondering, um, it seems to me that like the day of the Latina woman has arrived. Mm. Like there are roles being created regularly for yeah you know, latinos in general yeah and i was wondering what you think about that i think it's amazing as you've been coming up th- through theater and did it ever hold you back you know i think what it ne- i wouldn't say it would it was like a thing that held me back it could be frustrating at times because sometimes you would get an audition for something that was like i am not sure that this character is particularly fleshed out hmm. you know like I'm not sure that it's written to have complexity and depth like a real human being. Mm-hmm. It seems like just a placeholder. Yeah. And to me, those kinds of things are not as exciting as something that has depth, that has sort of, you know, humanness there. Because ultimately, that's what I want to explore is humanity and like all sides of all sides of that journey. Mm-hmm. Sides that I find recognizable and sides that I don't know anything about and that I'm nervous about exploring. And so what I think what has happened to me that I've been lucky enough to have happen is that I've been cast in things that acknowledge the fact that I'm Latina. Some of them are about Latino stories, like like Anna in the Tropics is a beautiful play that I was lucky enough to do. And that is about uh, a family of Cubans in Florida. And that was a beautiful, beautiful play. And the only way that I could have played that part was if I was Latina. Hmm. Similarly with Kiara's plays, like Yamaya's Belly, the only way that I could have played that amazing, incredible role, it was like a dual role where one part of it was this like young sort of street rat kind of girl and another role was this amazing sort of soothsayer that did this like beautiful dance, epic dance and poem like thing. It was just like this really magical moment on stage. I couldn't have done those that if I was Latina. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, there are roles that I've gotten and the director has said, you know, I kind of want to put like, um, I want to use your ethnicity to sort of highlight stories in this play. For example, when I played Isabella in Measure for Measure, the director, Bill Rausch, who's the artistic director at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, he directed that play. And he was like, I really want to set it in like, I want to. I don't want to say where it is because in the play it says they're in Vienna, I believe. I might be getting that wrong. But in the play it says they're in Vienna. So we decided that this city was like a big city. Let's say it's a big city like Detroit or New York. Mm-hmm. And what's happened in the city is that the people of color don't necessarily have the voting power or the power in office that they should have to represent themselves. And so subsequently, like most of the characters in the play were – people of color myself my brother was latino the guy playing angelo was latino which was a really interesting twist because he was a person in power Mm. and he was suddenly like using it in the wrong way like Hmm. so there was lots of elements of like just because you're of color or not of color doesn't make you the evil person in this play like it's humanity struggling with itself yeah which i thought was really cool because it didn't mean like oh all the latinos are the good guys and the white people are the bad guys no 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 that's not right at all across the board across the board like if you're a shitty person you you could like just act out like a shitty person yeah you know which i thought was really cool um and then there have been roles that 
don't have anything to do. Like Cat on the Hudson Roof, when I played Maggie and Cat on the Hudson Roof, nothing to do with me being Latina at all. Like just, I just played the role, you know? I didn't know that you played Maggie. Yeah, I played Maggie. I read it this morning. Ah, I, I finished, finished it this morning. It's so I did. good, right? Yeah, it, I, it was very intense. It's super intense. Like, it's such an intense story. I was like, you guys are all horrible people. <laughs> all of them. But like, so human. Very, so human. very. I actually, I think my favorite character was Big Daddy. Oh my God. Such a great character, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. great. So just like desperately grasping it. Like my life is almost over. What did I do right? Did I do any of it right? Mm-hmm. T- somebody tell me that I did something right. Mm-hmm. You know, show me, tell me, show me, anybody. You just lie to me. Lie to me and tell me that I did it right. You know? <sighs> so Yeah, great. and he... He is just trying to gain ground with his with brick with brick. I was like, wow! And then uh, the opening, the opening with Maggie. Oh my god! Yeah, my okay. heart is just like bleeding for her. Yeah. <laughs> She's just like scrambling for anything, like, and trying every tactic in the book in that opening. Like first she tries to be funny, then she tries to be sexy, then she tries to be funny and sexy, then she tries to like poke at him and pull at him and force him and shame him and. You know, just she's just anything at all, anything that she can do. Mm-hmm. She's just scrambling. She really is like a cat on a hot tin roof. It's like anything that she can, she can't stop. She can't stop moving. I played that role. I've seen, I've seen it done a, like a couple times before. I played it. Um, I got this actually from Dan. He, he always watches as many versions of the play that he can find. Hmm. Especially with Shakespeare, he like watch as many as he can, so you can see what other people are doing. And I used to be of the mind of like, no, I don't want to watch anyone else's work before I do my own thing. But now I kind of, I totally respect that idea because like, yes, let me see what somebody else did with these words that I'm going to also yeah. live in. Variations. Yeah. And like maybe there's something that's like, that they do that would sort of make my mind go in a direction that it wouldn't have gone before. But the productions that I watched that I enjoyed the most were the ones where Maggie moved the quickest through the language. So, like, I just rattled off that language. It was like, I tell you, I got so nervous at that table, I thought I would throw back my head and scream. Like, I was like, like, as fast as I possibly could. Like, <laughs> and it was fun because the audience would immediately just go, whoa, where are we going? Like, wee, you know? Because it's just her talking for that whole first act. It's just her talking. Yeah. So she's, like, yeah. just languidly talking to herself. Like, why would she be doing that in a room with him? Mm-hmm. You know, she would be like trying to fill the air with like any anything she could you know yeah and i and i i i mean you can just feel the longing because she's just you know in in the circles that she's going in i'm like oh my gosh and then the fact that brick barely says anything to her barely barely is acknowledging her and she's just like screaming for attention and she's literally moving around the sexy beautiful woman is moving around in front of this man in her underwear she takes off her dress and just like moving around in the space like preening like Mm -hmm. look at me look at me look at me like anybody else would just be you know falling all over themselves to get at her Mm -hmm. she's she used to be a beauty queen you know like in our production there was one day in rehearsal where i was so frustrated with that there's this part in that scene where she like comes back in and is like we're what's happening now we're doing it you know basically yeah she She, like goes out the door closes the door and then comes back in is that when he's like i'm embarrassed for you yes so right then oh, I would come back. I came back in during rehearsals and in rehearsals I was like in a slip because we were trying to get used to it. I came, I went out, I shut the door, I came back in and I took this slip off and I was just in my bra and underwear and stockings in the rehearsal hall and Danforth Comans, who played Brick, who was a freaking fantastic actor. He's such a solid actor. But I threw him in that rehearsal. His <laughs> jaw dropped and he was like, oh my God, I can't, I can't look at you because it was so shocking. It was just like, and, and that was something that I discovered in rehearsal because he was so good at blocking me out that I, mm. I was so frustrated as Maggie and as the actress that I couldn't get his attention. And so we kept that, we kept it. And like the audience got really uncomfortable and like very awake when that happened because on stage, it's so uncomfortable to see people like stripped down to, you know, less than a dress or yeah, something. Like yeah. When you see a character come on, especially Maggie, because you have this sort of idea that she's just in that slip. Mm-hmm. So she's safe and contained in that slip. And the minute that that slip came off, it was very electric mm-hmm. because that meant that she meant, she really meant business. And I was just standing around like talking and aggressively, like trying to get at him in a bra and underwear, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's so 
fantastic and fascinating what can happen on stage like it's so fun yeah just by making that one choice just that one choice like let's just lose this and it's nothing it's like a slip is nothing it's just this little slippery piece of lace and fabric but the minute that you discard it it means like the stakes have just gone so much higher yeah and i think as an audience member i would i just i i mean i identify with her Mm -hmm. in some ways i feel like i would feel that i was the one standing in my bra and underwear like no no oh my god don't do it don't (laughs) do it because he's gonna he's he's just gonna reject you girl like yeah abort (laughs) 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 yeah but so you were saying that um like that role was not specifically for like a latina or you know but you were you were still cast in it yeah and yeah that's beautiful. That's good. Yeah, it's. Just, I think it's a testament to what's happening in American theater right now, which mm-hmm. is people are interested in, and and honestly, what's happening in in all forms of art, like television, film, people are interested in seeing stories that look like the stories of, I mean, that reflect the stories of people that they see around them every day. You know, mm-hmm. and I mean, our Brooklyn Nine Nine is a perfect example of that. It's like, it's not colorblind casting. It's because mm-hmm. it, we are the colors of that we are but it reflects what new york looks like Mm -hmm. you know it reflects what like what the majority of the country looks like which is like looks like lots of different kinds of people Mm -hmm. you know we're all living together we're all just living together on this little ball spinning through the universe (laughs) (laughs) and you know about brooklyn 99 Mm. the ensemble you guys all come from so many different sorts of training backgrounds totally Which I find really interesting how, you know, yeah, it's really well cast, but all the talents that you guys are bringing to the table. So many different things, It's so interesting. Yeah, Yeah, because some people are like classically trained and then like some people are like improv trained and um, it's just very interesting to see this like grouping of talents. Yeah, some of us went to school for, for... for theater some of us went to school for film and you know some some i mean terry has had like a crazy different background like he was a professional athlete and then sort of fell into acting you know through through his wife like he was like backstage working on plays that she did and was like oh i think i could do that i want to do that i want to try that i mean like so many different paths you know yeah and like dirk his whole like his he's got like family history in television and then you have someone like joel who started out in new york theater and like touring around and touring companies like it's just so many different and chelsea who like did theater when she was very young mm-hmm. and then transitioned into stand-up and mm-hmm. then like then writing i mean she's had all sorts of different journeys yeah. melissa went to school for musical theater she did yes she was in the <laughs> musical theater uh school at nyu oh wow Crazy. were you guys in new york at the same time I think I was. I think I was there when she was working on the soap. When she was mm-hmm. after she had graduated and oh was right, because then the she was. She was. Then she was on the soap opera. That's see, and that's crazy. That's yeah. totally different. Totally from, different. But so cool. Yeah, very cool. So okay, so you went to college for theater. I did. Yeah, I went to Stevens College, which is a little women's college in Columbia, Missouri. Oh wow. Yeah. How did you decide to go there? Honestly, they were the ones that gave me the most money. <laughs> like That's a good choice. Yeah. And <laughs> and I like I was really interested in the idea of when I when I auditioned for them, the woman that auditioned me, um, the head of the department at the time, she said, you know, we really focus on on letting women be able to have the main roles in our productions and like the the stories are very focused on women because and then she said because you'll find once you hit the real world it's not always going to be like that so we want to give you a basis of feeling embraced like that so that when you leave our department you're ready for anything Hmm. and I thought like oh that's so cool I love that and there was like a liberal arts degree attached to it so it wasn't a conservatory for me that was very important because my parents really wanted me to get a liberal arts education as well. Like yeah. not just dive headfirst into theater because they were, I think they were worried that it wasn't going to work out, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I went to college there and it was a three-year program. And then in the middle, like between your first and second year, you stay at the college and do like summer, like a summer intensive. Mm-hmm. You like put on little plays and and then between the second and third year is the real test. You go all the way to Okaboji, Iowa where they own this 
theater that used to be an airplane hangar in the middle of this like vacation town called Okaboji. I've never heard of that town. Neither had I, girl. It was like, where are we going? Iowa in the middle of what? That name sounds so exotic. Okaboji, doesn't doesn't it? I think it was an American Indian name. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Of course. And like you put on (laughs) nine full length productions in 10 weeks. Full length productions. Colleen. do you write these? No, are the- they're like Fiddler on the Roof, Cinderella, like what? You know, I mean, like they're like legit, like legit. So everyone in the department is there, and if you're not, I mean, you barely <laughs> sleep. You're like either you're sewing costumes for something, or you're building a set for the next thing, or you're in rehearsals for the next thing. So or are you guys casting each other? No, we get cast before we go. It's okay, like one series of auditions before we go, and then okay. the whole cast list goes up, and then you go and like you literally got twenty minutes for lunch every day. Like that's it. Like you better scarf it down. You're always working. You're always, always, always working. There were a couple times where I like snuck away and like escaped. One time the stage manager was like banging on our cabin door. Like she knew I was in there. I was just hiding. Um like you needed a break. Yeah, I just needed like not to be ushering that night. Like you like you have to usher the plays. Like if you're not, you know, you have to help at, in the box office. I mean, like it's every single part of it. But like you live so and breathe like, it. Yeah. You just immerse in it. Like and you figure out really quick if it's for you or not. And I decided it was for me because it just felt like I just never felt so like alive, you know, like, yeah, I just, I, it was such a magical summer to me that that summer at Okaboji. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're so involved. It's like it's so it's involved. a it's a well oiled machine after a while. Mm-hmm. And you guys are are like your own production company. Mm-hmm. Truly. Like you're just making it happen. Truly, And everybody has to work hard. Everybody has to work hard because if you don't, somebody else has to pick up your slack. And that's like you just not being a team player. You're not being a real part of the ensemble then, you know. So was it kind of like Survivor sometimes, like where some people would just like leave, get yeah. booted off? Well, it, it's sort of our summer. It was different every summer, I think, like depending on the personalities of the people that were there. But our summer, it became very like people banded together, like they got in their own cliques mm-hmm. because that felt like the safest way to sort of be you know like I've got my four people and we're like a team you Mm -hmm. know no matter what happens like if I fight with so-and-so or I have like a blow up with this person or this person or whatever like I've got my people these Mm -hmm. four um I don't think anyone our summer left there was a lot of meltdowns and crying you know there was a lot of like I think that's normal when everyone's working that hard right especially if it's when there's actors too totally (laughs) and almost all women there were like two guys in our department like they did have males in the they had to okay and then they would also hire professional actors from new york to come Mm -hmm. and work with us um but yeah there was a lot of a lot of emotions Mm -hmm. a lot of emotions (laughs) and there was like politics about casting you know like people were upset about like like i was normally in the first the very first show usually the shows have two weeks to rehearse the very first show only has a week Hmm. And so usually that one has no students in it. It's all professionals and teachers. My summer, I was in that production. I was cast in it because I guess they thought I could handle it, which I could, but what I couldn't handle was the sort of severe isolation that I felt from the rest of the department Mm -hmm. after that happened because it was a lot of like, why did she get that? Like, how come she got it? And like that kind of stuff. Right. Which... At the time, I had, like, you know, like I said, I had my group of friends, like, four four good friends. And, like, they said to me, those girls were really dear friends at the time. They were, like, don't worry about it. Like, it's just people are just jealous. They're just trying to make your life hell because they wanted that part. And it's not even that big of a deal. Like, the summer's going to be over, and then no one's going to remember. Mm-hmm. And they were right. Like, mm-hmm. it's gone now. I can't even remember the name of the play. Oh, <laughs> everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten, which is a – musical that's like not very good sorry (laughs) (laughs) but yeah (laughs) so when you when you guys were well when you finished your degree Mm -hmm. is that when you made your decision to move to New York yeah like probably shortly before like I was I think after Okaboji I knew I was like okay I want to I want to go to New York so when someone embarks on a journey like that, because I mean, I, I've heard about people, you know, desiring to work in theater mm-hmm. and starting off in New York and mm-hmm. it's like, and they spend like a number of years, you know, broke as a joke yeah. or like doing like a lot of side jobs oh God, and so like, broke. yeah, what, what was that like? Cause, and, and how do you navigate that? Cause that's, um, it was it's like, how do you break in? 
you know, that was the question. That was always the question. Like, how do you break in? How do you break in? I had a very lucky journey. I got there and I had read about this company called Theater Works USA. Mm -hmm. And they produce children's shows, touring children's shows. Some of them are musicals, some of them are plays. And if you work, if you get cast in one, you can earn your equity card, which is the mm -hmm. union card. And once you have your union card, then you can audition for shows that are the legit kind of like at – regional theaters or whatever so ma the main things you need are an agent and an equity card hmm. and so I got I went on audition after audition for that particular company because I knew that that was my best shot and I got cast hmm. I got cast in Ferdinand the Bull I was one of the bulls <laughs> <laughs> it was so stupid <laughs> it's like I mean it was six months of the five of us in two vans, a passenger van and the and the the set van, just like driving every day to like another, you know, junior high or middle school, it, at six in the morning, unpacking the set, setting it all up, performing this musical for like little kids who are very honest theater goers. If they don't like it, they will straight up boo you or get up and walk out or pee in their pants or whatever they want to do. Where that, were you going in New York? We're just, well, we didn't like, we didn't go in New York. We just like we did like maybe a couple schools in New York, but then we went on tour. We were like in Virginia and South Carolina and Texas and Louisiana. Like we went all the way around the country. Like Wow. It was crazy. It was crazy. And like it doesn't matter how much you think you like people, you are not gonna like them very much if you spend that much time in a van <laughs> with them. Like it was hard. <laughs> da, 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 da. Was that six months you were just traveling? It was with about those six people? months, yeah. Oh yeah. But then when I was done, I had my equity card. And then Freedom. Yeah. And then I did another tour with them because it was a better role. It was Romeo and Juliet. Mm. And it was the same director. And I auditioned for it and I really wanted it badly and I got it. And so I was I did so I did that. I did it for a long time, but it was a great job. At the time, it was like, oh my God, $250 a week. <laughs> like, it was yeah. like more than I was making doing Consistent anything else. Consistent income. Truly, and doing the thing that you like to do. Yeah. Even like, if it is in a gym mm -hmm. with like a bunch of high school kids throwing pennies at your head while you're like doing the last soliloquy or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So, did you ever do any improv training? No. I've always been horrified, mortified, deathly scared of improv. Still to this day. To this day. To this day. It's better now because I'm surrounded with people that are comfortable doing it. And so now it feels safe to take risks. Yeah. Safer. Yeah. Like I know that people aren't going to look at me like I'm an idiot, you mm -hmm. know, if something falls flat on its face. But because everything was so has been so scripted. Everything's so scripted. So but but there are times where we were like sort of allowed to play a little bit at the end of the scenes and yeah. first and second season those would give me heart palpitations like mm -hmm. my hands would immediately start my hands are sweating now just talking about it <laughs> like it makes me so nervous to improv so nervous <laughs> i much prefer to be scripted and then play within the script yeah when you were you know acting in the plays i mean were you guys encouraged to play around and like well not invent? with the words no, ne yeah. Never with the words. I mean, Just with your actions, and yes. your choices. Dan, Dan, my boyfriend says it really well. He's like, if a play is structured, if if the rehearsals have gone the way that they should, what ends up happening is that you and the other actors and the director have built this like jungle gym, hmm. right? You've made this jungle gym with with the script, mm -hmm. and then in the run of the play you can just like acrobat all over that jungle gym. You can do whatever you want. You can hang upside down. You can do a flip off of it. You can climb up it really fast or hang upside down for a really long time or whatever mm -hmm. you want. The structure is solid. Hmm. And so then you can just explore and play within the jungle gym, you know? And I always thought that was such a good image for what it should be. It should feel like a really sturdy thing that you can just play inside mm -hmm. because you don't want to go too far outside of the boundaries of the play because then it becomes something else you mm -hmm. know but you do want to have room to move in it because it needs to feel alive and like it's happening for the first time every night mm -hmm. that's the challenge of doing a play is that like you have to make it feel to the audience as if it's coming alive for the first time ever in the history of man mm -hmm. tonight when you're watching it that's a challenge, it's, a straight up challenge. It's a straight up challenge, but <laughs> if when it's working, yeah, it's like nothing else. It's it's electric. Yeah, it's so amazing. I feel like that would probably be the best high. Oh my ever. god, it's so it's so incredible. 
it's so incredible when you can feel that the audience is with you too mm-hmm. like if you're lucky it happens like a few times during the night in a play like mm-hmm. if you're really lucky it happens a few times hmm. but like there'll be a moment where something's happening on stage and like it's almost like your mind splits and you're sort of outside of yourself too and you can feel that the audience is like it's like you're sitting in the audience watching them watch you hmm. and you can feel that you're all connected it's like a thread is just running through every single person in the audience like to you and That's the other person magical. on stage yeah it's amazing it's amazing so you were how long were you living in new york for I think I lived there five years altogether. Yeah, but I didn't really live there all that time because I was always out of town. So it was yeah, like yeah, because you were you were on the road exactly. Mm-hmm. So I would ha- I held on to the apartment there, but I would be like in Pittsburgh for three months or mm-hmm. in Hartford, Connecticut for four months or something. So how did you end up making this transition into television? Well, and film. Yeah. So I got a job doing. Shakespeare at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Okay. And, and Dan Dan and that's where I met Dan. Okay. Yeah. So the the Shakespeare Festival contract is very long, which is like a dream if you're a theater actor cuz like normally like I said it's 2 to 3 months. And to do Shakespeare to do, the whole, Yeah. Wow. And like also like cla- they don't just do Shakespeare, they do like classical plays or like I did Canon Hudson Roof there or they do like American classics and they also produce new plays. So they're do they're dabbling in everything. Now they're doing musicals too. So I got a contract to do to be there for 10 months. And I was like, oh, yes, this is going to be amazing. And while I was there, I fell in love with Dan. Mm. And and then I thought, like, what am I? Why am I going back to New York? What am I doing there? Like, what am I doing there? I'm not sure. So then we both got another contract. So it was like, okay, we're both coming back here for the next year. He was going to play Hamlet. Um, Where was he living? He was between places. He was like a gypsy. He was like all over the place. (laughs) Um, Before that, he had been in New York doing Scar on Broadway for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So we were like everywhere. So then this the second season came. We both stayed for another 10 months. And then we were like, what should we do? Should we like move in together? Do you want to go to New York? Should we try LA? Like I've never thought about going there. Maybe it would be safer with you, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And so we decided to do it. Then I got another contract. I got it. We both got offered another contract. Dan was like, I'm good. I just played Hamlet. I don't need to do any (laughs) Shakespeare for a while. I got asked to play Isabella in Measure for Measure. And I had never Mm -hmm. played such a such a role. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I can't turn it down. So I stayed another 10 months. Dan came here. He sort of set up shop, as he likes to say. And then I came after the season was done. And then we just started auditioning here. Wow. Yeah, it was hard. I had to learn to drive. I didn't know how to drive, Colleen. You didn't need to, I guess. I didn't right? need to up until up until I really needed to. And then <laughs> I had to learn like in four months. And I was like, uh. You need to learn here. Yeah. Well, I had my license here. I, I actually learned in Oregon, which was much safer. Okay. My, one of my friends. <laughs> I was going to say eight lane highways. Oh, my oh gosh. Oh, my gosh. I, well, the first time I was like, I, this is it. This is how I die. Today is the day that mm-hmm. I go. And it was like unknown actress dies in. <laughs> <laughs> I stole well, that while getting off of the 134. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I stole that from some article that I read about Lynn before Hamilton came out. Like he was really afraid something was going to happen to him and like mm. it was all just going to like mm-hmm. boop. it just never happened, mm-hmm. you know. And Hamilton says that in the play a lot. He talks about like I I think about death so much it feels like a memory. Hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mhm. Anyway, side note. Um yeah, I had to learn how to drive. My friend, one of my friends who actually recently passed away, Catherine Colson, who played the log lady. I remember on Twin seeing, Peaks. Yeah, yeah, she looks, lo- she looks she lovely. She was lovely. She was a lovely human being. She played Big Mama in Cat on Hot Tin Roof when we did it. She was incredible. Incredible. But she, <sighs> she taught me how to, like, she was one of the people that taught me how to drive. Oh. Yeah, she would, like, come and pick me up in her little Prius and we would go driving for, like, a couple hours and... That's yeah. so cool. That's she was always like that. So generous. What with a her great time. memory. I know. <laughs> like, she was awesome. I know how to drive because of her. Yeah. And she was like, don't now don't roll through the stop signs because that's what they're going to they're going to look for that on the test. You have to completely stop at the stop line stop sign. Don't don't roll through. <laughs> she was so sweet. <laughs> gentle teaching. Very gentle. Very mm-hmm. gentle. Mm-hmm. She was right. <laughs> she's right that was one of the first things i did the lady on my test was like now stop at this uh, so just drive all the way to the stop sign and then take a right and i was like okay just stop 
stop, fully stop. And then she gave me that note after which she's like, good job not rolling through the stop signs. I was like, oh, thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Hundred percent paid off. Hundred <laughs> percent. So, did you know you should get an agent here right away? Well, and then, like, and and in theater, do people get headshots? Oh yeah. Also for theater. Yes. Okay, so that's not a, a new thing. No, yeah, that was that was. I knew I was going to need that. I had those. Um, I actually was very lucky. I've been very lucky in my career. I did a play here right. I think right before. I can't remember my timeline at at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I was like, maybe I did a, did a season and then went away. I can't remember. But I did a play here in L.A. in 2009 called Lydia, written by Octavio Solis, who's an amazing, amazing playwright, directed by Julia Carrillo. And it actually started out at, it started out in Colorado. And then we went to Yale Rep. And then we did the final production here. And when we were here, two of the actors in the show had the same agency and they came to the show to see opening night and then afterwards it was the very first time I'd ever been like courted by an agent because he was just like hey do you have an agent do you do you have an agent you should come you should come to the office and like meet with us we should talk we should talk we should talk <laughs> and I was like whoa and so at the time I had a New York agent um and I decided that I wanted to have an LA agent instead because I was probably going to move here mm -hmm. so I was lucky like I had something that was in a theater that they were able to come and see what I was capable of that's a great way, actually, mm -hmm. I think of just moving out here. Oh, my God. You know, be be acting in yeah. plays or yeah. going out for plays and then also, you know, working on your film and television career. I yeah. feel like there's no reason people shouldn't be doing both. Correct. I, I do think it's more difficult here to be involved in the theater scene because there are fewer, I would say, like, I don't want to say reputable, but, like, fewer theaters that are doing productions that are not on say like a 99 seat contract or something like mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of theaters here yeah but, i've noticed that yeah but not all of them are doing um well i mean i could just be very blunt like high say, quality like, work? yeah they're not all doing high quality work and you know how could we make that scene better here do you think i don't know because I mean, live theater is so great it's so great but there's the siren call of film and television and mm -hmm. the and the paychecks mm -hmm. of that, you know, and the and the all the things that you can do for yourself and your family and your loved ones with that bigger paycheck is very attractive mm -hmm. versus like, you know, going and doing a play every night for, you know, six nights a week, which might be really wonderful for your soul. But you right. might have to have like a second job to do that, you know, because that maybe that theater company doesn't have enough money in its budget to even pay its actors you know mm. like you're just doing it for free every night or maybe you're paying a fee to be a part of a theater company to do that mm -hmm. so it's sort of it's a little bit of a, a, a broken toy in that way like it still is beautiful and you can still play with it but mm -hmm. it's a little bit broken mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know what the answer is to that I mean it's like I want there to be good theater in LA yeah and there is there is and some of these smaller companies are doing amazing theater but there's also the sort of stigma that's attached to theater in LA which like sometimes is true and sometimes is not which is like well why are they doing a play if they're in LA they should be you know it's probably not going to be any good because that you know hmm. so I don't know and it's weird it should actually be looked at as a good thing like yeah like oh well like this person has time to do a play mm -hmm. and that's really fortunate because they're a really great actor and now I get to see them live mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how great is that you mm -hmm. know like for you it's like so you're on a series so your time is you know invested yeah already it's kind of spoken for yeah although you know when you have hiatus you know you go on hiatus and stuff and you know when the season is going to wrap mm -hmm. so it's like you could plan Oh, I'll start auditioning yeah. for some shows or something. Yeah. Are, are you I did, itching? I, to... I had an audition in New York for a play that oh. I would love to be in, but I don't want to say anything else about it just in case it okay. didn't happen. But I would, I would kill to be in a play in New York, especially because it was the place that like I went to try to do it, and it didn't happen there. You know, I was never, I never, I did like one production in New York, and it was like for a week. Hmm. a week long in a festival and it was like it felt like a dream come true because it was like oh, i'm going to the theater i'm gonna go do my play tonight you know so you're overdue i'm overdue yeah. you're overdue for I, your would time there. I would love to do a play there yeah it would be it would feel like a dream come true and it, I, I think like doing 
theater here. I've done a play. I did a play here at the Kirk Douglas um, mm -hmm. over in Culver City, like right when I first got here, and that was wonderful. I did a I did Lydia at the Taper, which was also wonderful. I would love to work in one of those theaters again. Like I also think it's like more challenging here because we don't have like in New York you could live in you can live in Brooklyn and like get on the train and go see a play in Midtown. You know, mm -hmm. all the plays are in the same place. They're all there. It's all sort of collectively either there or like maybe some theaters on the Upper West Side, some theaters like downtown, but like it's so easy to get to them, mm -hmm. you know, it's so easy and accessible to like yeah. get to your art. Where here, like part of the challenge is like actually just getting to the art is a challenge, mm -hmm. like fighting the traffic at a traditional time the play starts is like around eight o'clock. So like, oh mm -hmm. God, we're really gonna have to fight traffic <laughs> to get to the play. Right. You know, yeah. so, and it's like, oh, it's across town. I don't know. It's going to be an hour to get there. And then should we have dinner? And like, it becomes sort of a. It's an event. It's it like becomes a whole an event. event. Yeah. And it becomes something that you can really only do if you have extra money to do that, you know, mm -hmm. to have that be part of your, you've got a little flexibility with your cash so you can like spend mm -hmm. it on an evening of art, you know, two tickets to the theater. That's like what, 80 bucks plus dinner, plus parking, you know, mm -hmm. that's like, it's an expensive thing to do, mm -hmm. you know, for, for a lot of people. Whereas like a movie, it's so accessible, right. you know? Right. And, and it, and like, and there's so many safe bets. Like if, if you think about like how much uh, an average family makes mm -hmm. and like, let's say there's four of you and you all are going to go to the movies together, that's hmm. roughly $20 a head plus snacks. You kind of want to put your money like, in a safe bet so you're gonna go see like a blockbuster or you're gonna go see something that's like you're pretty sure you're gonna get your money's worth mm -hmm. and you know, your family's gonna have a good time you mm -hmm. know and I think that's why like network television's never gonna die because like people need it they they want access to joy and fun that yes feels almost free you know mm -hmm. I need it I need it too <laughs> I mean I love turning on the tv and like having it in the background I mean I needed it when I was a kid we couldn't afford cable like I loved The Simpsons. I remember watching mm. the first Simpsons Christmas special and just feeling like, oh, what's this? Where mm. has this been? Mm -hmm. And I would wait for it every week. Seinfeld was the same way. My dad and mm. I would watch it together. And like, and then when it was syndicated, it was even better because like I could just wander into his bedroom like around that time at night and just like plop down and watch it with him. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, we, and we didn't have to pay for it. It was like, it was there. Well, we yeah. just had to pay for the electric bill. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Just had to keep the TV on. That's it. <laughs> I feel um, always amazed when I'm driving. I love driving around LA. Like yeah. sometimes when I have to drive, like let's say I've, I'm driving to West Hollywood or something, or even just to Santa Monica. Sometimes I, it's really nice to just buckle up and then settle in and decide you're just going to drive through the city yeah. over there. I, I will notice different theaters mm -hmm. that I never saw before. Yeah, like and, little hole in the wall situations. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes they have little signs outside. And I'm like, oh, I, I got to remember mm. to go to a show at that theater and support them. Why? Because I'm curious. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And um, ha how's my follow through been? Not, not super good. Yeah, yeah. And I... Um, I feel like, I don't know why that is, mm -hmm. but, um, but you said, so, so Dan's going to be in a show. Yes. He's going to be in a show at the Geffen, which is a sort of more reputable, very reputable theater here in LA, um, on near the UCLA campus. It's like basically the, like, I would say like some of the bigger ones, not the only big ones, but like the Mark Taper, the Geffen, the Kirk Douglas, those kinds of like. That, that have equity contracts that can afford to like actually pay the actors a living, a real living wage, mm -hmm. you know? And he's going to be in Outside Mullingar, mm -hmm. which I think opens November 18th, mm -hmm. which from the sound of it, he won't let me read the whole thing, but <laughs> from the sound of it, it's going to be really a beautiful play by John Patrick Shanley, who also wrote Doubt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's probably going to be really beautifully well-written and intricately structured. Yes. Like you want to go on that ride yes yeah I wanted to know well actually a thought that I had before I got here was you know what did your life look like three years ago <laughs> and what does your yeah. life look like now let's see three years ago was 2011 <laughs> right uh, tw 2012 2012 20 wait what are we 2015 or 2015 oh snap okay, 12 12 yeah. I know time so that was flying. first season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine mm-hmm well, I'll tell you this story. When we were shooting 
the first, not the pilot, but when we were shooting like the first three episodes, I remember sort of like trying to sort of bring it up in conversation to Joe and Melissa. I was like, so did you guys get your first paycheck yet? Like just kind of, hey, did you get, did you get your first paycheck yet? Because I had like maybe $100 in my bank account. I had no money. I was like, we were shooting the first couple episodes and I was still teaching at Pop Physique. I was still teaching bar classes because I needed money. Mm-hmm. It was just in a different world. I was like stressed about money all the time. I was like, Dan, I'm so sorry. I have to pay you back for rent this month. I can't, I can't get it together. Like I don't have enough. Like, yeah, that has gone away a bit <laughs> to say the least. Like, um, and it was embarrassing in a weird way. Like now I wish I could sort of say to myself, it's okay. Like I wish I could go back and be like, girl, everybody struggles. It's fine. Like you don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> when I say that out loud, it sounds like Melissa, which is so funny because she's <laughs> such a positive force in my life. She's so like, mm. girl, it's fine. Girl, you got it. You know, she's always like that. And, mm. and like that influence in a, as a friend has been so priceless to me in my life. Like, I wish I could go back to myself and say that because like there's nothing to be embarrassed of. There's nothing to be embarrassed of. That time was not an embarrassing time. It was a, I was bomb and strong mm-hmm. like during that time. But it felt so embarrassing because I was like asking other people if they had like gotten their paycheck yet because I felt embarrassed that I didn't have money, you know? Mm-hmm. But that's something like so many people struggle with and there's no shame. There's, there's no shame in that. It's hard to make money, you know? It's hard. It's really hard. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to like, in this country especially, like to have like, a, you can't live on minimum wage in this country. So like, yeah, what do you do? You know, Mm -hmm. what do you do if you're an actor? You can't really take a job, a jobby job, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to find something that's flexible. It's like an in-between kind of thing that will let you go to auditions, that will like let you try to chase your dream while you try to make enough money to live every month, you Mm -hmm. know. So it was a highly anxious time. Mm -hmm. Like I'm still anxious about stuff, but not as much about that, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, some of that burden has lifted off. Has lifted off, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So you're like, where's that paycheck? Wait, no. Yeah, you, I, day you guys, uh, you guys, uh. <laughs> and then when it came, I was like, whoa. Yeah. It was so great. And we were living, we were living in a slightly, slightly smaller place. Um, when we moved in together, I didn't have any furniture or anything. So the place that we were living in, I didn't really realize it at the time, but it didn't reflect me at all. It was all mm-hmm. of Dan's stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he noticed, you know, because like, why would he ever notice that? You know, you wouldn't notice that. Like if someone moved into your house, unless they brought stuff with them, mm-hmm. you know, at the time, like, I think it was like kind of making me crazy in a way that I didn't realize. Like, mm-hmm. and now like in this, in this apartment, I have my own office and it's like all like very feminine and pink and like, it feels like my sanctuary, which is like a really wonderful thing to have. Cause you had just come, I mean, you were bouncing around from show I mean, to yeah. show and so yeah it makes sense that you didn't really have a bunch of things no and I moved here with like two boxes it's the same as I moved to New York I had like two boxes and a suitcase it was the same that I moved here with like nothing mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. just so I could number one so that it wouldn't be expensive to ship things and number two so so that like I could sort of start mm-hmm. you know start a new start a new yeah clean slate yeah <laughs> and and then another thing that was happening in my life at the time was that I was actually very lonely I didn't know a lot of people mm-hmm. here because I had moved to New York and I had so many friends from my college I had people that were alums of the program that were already in New York and like I made very like I had a network of people very quickly I didn't have to work on it moving here was so drastically different like hmm. when we started shooting the show I was so lonely like hmm. I I would look so forward to going to work because it was like interaction with people you mm-hmm. know um, are you an extrovert mm, I don't know I like people I read something once that said like introverts like after a party they have to like take a lot of time to themselves to like yeah. regroup I don't really feel that way so I guess I am an extrovert I wouldn't ever think to describe myself that way but I like throwing parties like I like having like all my girlfriends over and stuff yeah I think it is just how do you refuel mm-hmm. do you refuel by maybe you're maybe you're like right in the middle probably like Sometimes you refuel with people. And sometimes, sometimes not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably. What do you think about the community here in Los Angeles? I think it's cool. I mean. Do you think there is a community? Like when you said you were lonely, is that just because things were in transition for you in general? But no, I think, I think like LA gets such a bad rap 
especially from New Yorkers. Sorry, New Yorkers that are listening to this, but like, <laughs> it get, it's very like, oh, that place is so fake. It's so you know, it, it has a sort of stigma attached to it. But I think it really is what you make it. I think mm-hmm. you can create your your community here, mm-hmm. but you have to be willing to sort of seek it out a little bit. Hmm. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. Like you have to you have to like take a class and maybe meet some people at that class or like start talking to your bread lady or like, you know, yeah. like you have to you have to put yourself out there a little bit so that you can see that other people are just living the same thing that you are, which is like, I feel kind of lonely. I wish that person would talk to me, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So th- so just be, decide, I'm going to go talk to that person. Yeah, or I'm going to, like, what I did was I looked up a couple girls that I knew from college that lived here. I didn't know them in college because they were, they, they graduated after me. But I looked them up on Facebook and was like, do you want to go on a hike? Do you guys want to hang out? You know, cut to, like, two years later and we're, like, taking a hiking trip to Sedona together, you know? Oh. like. My God! Yeah, so like it, I reached out. I tried to like, and and pop physique was actually a big part of that because I started taking classes there, and then I started doing desk work there, and I would talk with the teachers in between their classes. And one of my really good friends now, Shauna, who used to teach there, we're on the dance team together now, and we talk a lot. We, you know, we've shared so many things mm-hmm. about our lives with each other, and that would never have happened if I hadn't said like to myself, "Ah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna like." Maybe I'll work the desk there for a little while. Like, mm-hmm. And then like the dance team, the dance yeah. squad has been like the LA City Municipal Dance Squad yes. has been a major friendship thing for me. Like, When did you start doing that? I actually, I'm, I, I had met um, this writer and actress, Elena Craveo. I think that's how you say her last name. She's great. So funny. So brilliant. She and her partner, Heidi Niedermeyer, wrote the... Um, Things People Say in L.A. Do you remember mm. that sketch? Yes, I really liked it. Loved actually. it, right? Yeah. Those, so those two geniuses wrote that. They're so it funny. It was good. It was right Al- on. It was right on. <laughs> Elena's the taller one and Heidi's the shorter one. And Elena and I had been friends since I moved to L.A. because my one of my friends from New York had introduced me to her. And I started following her Instagram and I noticed that she was on this dance team. And I was like, what is this thing? So I followed their Instagram and I became obsessed. It was like mm. it was like drill team, like what I was telling you about, mm-hmm. but for grown up girls. And it was like very tongue in cheek. It wasn't like they were all professional dancers or something. They were just like a, a group of women that were really fun and funny and that yeah. just happened to like to dance yeah that were dancing for halftime games at women's basketball games like Mm -hmm. the la city parks and rec women's basketball pickup games Mm -hmm. and it was started by another actress angela trimber who weirdly like right after i started following this instagram i met her at a party at joe latrulio's house (laughs) because they had done a project together and she was at this party and for some reason it sort of came up in conversation she was like oh we're having auditions soon and i was like what so hey, I've been following you guys. Yeah, I was like, I didn't want to like nerd out, you know, yeah. but I was like, uh. And then I auditioned. <laughs> I took Shauna from Pop with me because Shauna is also like, she's an amazing creative person. Hmm. She also teaches dance to little kids. So hmm. like secretly in my brain, I was like, I'm pretty much like level three, like, mm-hmm. uh, like a three-year-old with choreography. <laughs> like if Shauna comes with me, she can like break it down for me and help me learn it. <laughs> And we auditioned oh, and we good. made it. It's been like so fun. It's like just this really cool group of ladies that we get together every Sunday and we rehearse for three hours and then we get together on Monday nights and rehearse for a couple more and then Tuesday nights we dance at the games. I love seeing your posts so about it because you're so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. But all of you guys are happy too. Yeah. And it looks like it's um, like so joyous. It doesn't look showy is what I mean. Yeah. Like it looks like you guys are like genuinely having a blast yeah I think we all are I mean for me I can't speak for anyone else but for me I'm like living out a real fantasy of like having stayed on drill team yeah really I guess that's what it is like what would happen if I stayed on drill team this you know like I would have gotten to like continue like expressing myself in that really fun funny way yeah so now you're doing it in LA yeah now I'm doing it in LA (laughs) with a group of grown-up ladies yeah (laughs) like this is a little bit um um, off the topic, but I was wondering if you could talk about working on the latest Pee Wee film. Yeah, I can because probably talk about that. I love Pee Wee. Oh man, so do I. Well, I mean, just what was it like working with him? It was awesome. Yeah. It was like everything that you wanted it to be and more. Paul Rubens is the most generous 
genuine, gentlemanly guy. Hmm. But he also has a streak of like very naughty blue humor that's like great. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but like the first day, like this will give you an example of what kind of person he is. The first day, number one, he knew everybody's name down to like the grips. Like every he knew wow. everyone's name. Everyone. I'm pretty sure he, he had his assistant go around and get everyone's birthday too. Oh my god! Yeah, that's the kind of guy he is. Then we start, we're about to start with the very first scene and it's myself, Jessica Poli, and Alia Shawkat. And we're going to do this like silly scene with him. And he stops and says like, before we start, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that every single one of you is here. And I'm just so glad that you're doing this film with me. It's in a dream of mine for such a long time. And, and if... If when we're making this film, you can think of anything that would make it funnier. Like if, you, if you're watching the scene and you think like, oh, I wonder if this would be funnier. I want to know. Now, I don't want 300 opinions at once. And then everyone started laughing. He was like, but I'm serious. I really want to know if the, I want this movie to be the best it can be. And I want to hear what you have to say. Hmm. And I was like, who <laughs> says that? Like who? <laughs> you're Pee Wee. You don't have to say that. But it's almost like he is Pee Wee because he says things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, like he... He's had the longevity that he's had and the ch- and considering the challenges that he's had, like mm-hmm. he's been ostracized. He's just like, he's so genuine and generous and like cool and funny and like, it was just a dream. It was like a dream come true. I used to watch Pee Wee's Playhouse yes. every weekend. It was my favorite show to watch. Mm-hmm. It's cuckoo at Pee Wee's Playhouse. <laughs> like, and there we were in scenes with him. Do you have a favorite character? From the Playhouse? Yeah. Hmm hard to say i mean i really do think he was my favorite but i yeah. love zombie the floating head yes me too I like love. a like a hi i'm like a hiney ho yeah. i love that <laughs> i loved the flowers that would be like peewee someone's coming you know i loved them before miss yvonne would show up oh and- miss yvonne I, yeah miss yvonne was definitely i think probably some of my ideals of beauty came from miss yvonne mm. it was like cinched waist and the big hair yes and the manners and i loved her oh but you know who my favorite was penny Oh, that's such a, cre- so creative. So creative. Mm-hmm. She was truly like, I would wait and hope every episode that there was going to be a Penny <laughs> situation because it was like a little girl giving her opinions about things. Mm-hmm. Just like me, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was like, I had never heard that or seen that before. You know, like the camera focused on, I mean, granted she was made out of clay, but like focused on a little girl and whatever she wanted to talk about, her mm-hmm. story mm-hmm. that day, whatever it was about. Just her opinions and her thoughts. Mm-hmm. Like, I think now, I'm just saying it out loud now, but I think that's probably what attracted me to Penny so much. It's mm-hmm. like, cool, I've never seen that before. Yeah. You know? Hello. Hello. My name is Penny. <laughs> Ding. So this film, mm-hmm. what's the premise for this one? So this one is called Pee-wee's Big Holiday. And it's not, I don't think, we'll have to see when it's all edited together, but it's not necessarily a continuation from like Pee-wee's Big Adventure or anything. It starts out and Pee-wee's been living in this little town and he like, he doesn't do anything or go anywhere. He has his little routine and he's happy. He's like happy within his routine. But there's some things that sort of are making him kind of unhappy. Like other, other things are changing and he's not really sure how he fits in in the world anymore. And he's, he's like working. I don't want to give anything away. Gosh, I don't want to get in trouble. But like he's working, let's say, I don't want to give away his job. He's working in a place and like, he receives like a visitor the visitor sort of changes his life a little bit and says like you he invites him to something he invites him to an event mm-hmm. and Wee decides to go and mm. it's like a big deal for him to like leave this little town and go on this holiday mm-hmm. and through the course of the holiday you're gonna get to see all the things that you loved from <laughs> Wee's big adventure basically like it's like the same sort of like it's like all those things that you loved about the movies like meeting these crazy characters and like having this like weird little experience and then on to the next you know yeah and, and like, he's so genuine and nice uh, and sweet he's so genuine and he's learning things every step of the way about himself like and then there's these like wonderful little like nods to the show and nods to the films it's just like all these like great surprises that like i know like when i read it i was like oh like i was so (laughs) excited because i kept thinking about how people were going to respond to it because people our age we have such great clear memories of those movies and that tv show yeah and this is it's going to satisfy that appetite 
okay. for it so well. Like I'm so excited. Yeah, you're really gonna feel like ah, like you ate a delicious meal after. Can you, you say it. like who you? What you yes, I can say who I'm playing. So me, myself, Alia, and uh, Jessica, we play a girl gang, mm. and at one point we get into trouble with him. I guess okay. that's probably all I'm probably allowed to say. We're bad girls. We're real bad. Cool. Yeah. And my character, Freckles, is definitely, I would say, maybe like kind of weirdly bloodthirsty. Like, I think she really gets off on like adventure and hijinks and like being bad. She's so insane. There were a couple <laughs> times where our director, John Lee, would like, he would cut and be laughing at us and be like, you're crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> you're making the craziest faces. I don't know if any of these takes have any of you like in a normal face. <laughs> And I, that really made me so happy because it was such it's such a departure from first of all from Rosa but mm -hmm. like from anything I've played in a long time she's just really wacky and the costumes are really great I'm sure I can share about those because they're online but like they were having a little sort of not trouble but the costume costume designer and John and uh, Paul mm -hmm. were sort of trying to figure out like what's the look what is the look like we, we don't really know like they were trying all sorts of different things and it's, for a while it was like kind of 50s and then it kind of swung to 60s and then finally I think it was Paul maybe it was John but they started saying faster pussycat kill kill hmm. which is a Russ Myers movie I think that's that's right and that there's three girls in it they're bad girls and as soon as they said that it was like oh that's those are the costumes so they're these very stylized costumes and they basically look just like the costumes from that movie from those those three bad girls. I haven't seen it. I need to see it. Dude, just Google it and an okay. image will pop right up and you'll be like, oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> I'm like in this like funny little polka dot half top. I'm wearing a red wig in it. I'm like strawberry blonde in this movie. Like I look totally different. Ollie has got this like very Sophia Loren situation happening, very like short hair and like lips and hips and like we all have like padding on all of us are padded in our hips and boobs so awesome. that we had like this like very 60s shape it was really fun jessica's like in this like extra hair wig thing i mean jessica has like very short hair and they had her in like this bouffant it was really <laughs> fun it felt in that way it felt super theatrical because it was like these costumes that just made us look like amped up yeah. cartoons basically like human cartoons yeah it was so fun do you guys look like you belong together yeah we look like we stepped out of a 60s movie and we look like a little team it's really quite something i can't wait when when do they say they're gonna release I it i think they said march okay yeah. something that i think is really interesting is how you are so different from rosa mm. like in real life yeah and I love that. And I love. What do you mean, Colleen? We're just alike. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were saying before that your core values are yeah. kind of similar. Yeah, our core, core values, values are certainly similar. Yeah. It's funny when when um, I tell people like you know that you laugh a lot, or uh. they're like, really? <laughs> Like, yeah, she's really smiley. Acting, you know? guys. <laughs> Acting. <laughs> Have you yeah. had that, though? Like, people think that, you know, you're really, like, stoic. Like. Oh, sure. Yeah, people. Well, like, on Twitter, uh, when I first started my Twitter, a lot of fans from the show were, they sort of came off a little bit, like, disbelieving or angry almost. Like, why are you so different than she is? Why are, what, what? This, this, this is very weird for me, you know? And I was like, well, it's kind of weird for me too. I mean, I, I pretend to be another person at work. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty weird. It's a weird yeah. thing, you know, to pretend to be someone else. And I get it because, like, if someone's watching the show, their only experience of meeting me ever is Rosa. Mm -hmm. And she and I are very different. So that's what you would expect. It's like dating someone. Like, if you, if you go on a website and, like, look at someone's dating profile and, like, look at the pictures, that's who you expect to receive. You read their profile and pretty much expecting, great, I'm going to meet Doug. He likes bike riding and horses and he owns two dogs and he likes being outside. And then if Doug shows up and he's, like, like very bookish and like clearly never works outside yeah. and like hates all the dogs that you pass by on the street you're gonna be like what is this yeah so I imagine it's similar to that mm -hmm. what it was really fun about visiting I just recently went to New York to see Hamilton and uh, among other things and like there were a couple times where I did get recognized because I was wearing a leather jacket because <laughs> the weather was cooler there yeah. and I was wearing my black yeah. leather jacket and people recognized me on the street it was a little boy in a hotel lobby that recognized me. And in fact, we had like, wow. yeah, he was sitting across from me. I was waiting for a friend. He was sitting across from me and he had this funny little hat on. And I was like, hey, man, I like your hat. And he was like, thanks. 
And then shortly after, he like scurried away. And I was like, oh, OK, I guess that's the whole exchange. That was cute. Ten minutes later, he and his mom and his sister came back. And the mom started asking me if she could take a picture and that her son and they were Scottish. They'd come from Scotland on their family vacation. And she said they loved the show. And he just didn't want to ask you for a picture earlier because he, was, he wasn't sure it was you. And he was like, because you were so nice. <laughs> That's what he said out loud. And I was like, oh, wow. I guess it – I mean, it happens that, like, I just don't come across in regular life as I do as Rosa because – I'm not Rosa. You're not. Yeah, you're not Rosa. <laughs> yeah. It's like um, as soon as they say cut, you're like. Yeah. Dee, 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 dee. Smiles. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A question I thought of this morning was, do you know of any Rosas in your life? Yes. Yes. What's that like for you? to? Exp- are, are you like, I, I know you. Yes. I play you. Yes. I mean, I think... I say this a lot and it does kind of sound cliche, but I think Rosa exemplifies to me what a lot of women feel underneath a lot of the time, which is I am frustrated by society's limits on my gender. I'm frustrated by the fact that I am expected to be polite. I am expected to be nice. I am expected to be kind. I am expected to be the peacemaker. I am expected to be the soft one when none of those expectations are necessarily put upon the other gender. Not to say that the other gender doesn't take those on. Mm -hmm. Andy's a great example of someone that I think of as an amazing feminist and is all of those things that I just said. Hmm. But what's frustrating, what can be frustrating as a woman is that it's pushed on you to be that way. It's expected of you, you know? And Mm -hmm. that's frustrating because no one wants to be told what they are allowed to be, Mm -hmm. you know? And so for Rosa, she just does what she wants. She just is who she is. And that can include softening, but it doesn't have to, mm-hmm. you know? And for her, what's, what's faster and what gets to better, let's say like better work, faster work, doing her job better, is cutting to the chase. Like in all her relationships, she cuts to the chase. Like for her, that's what works because mm-hmm. that's her personality. But that's specific to her, right? Like that being said, I think the thing that I think that many people can identify with is the fact that there's many instances in our lives where we want to do that, Mm -hmm. but we're told that we shouldn't. We're told that we can't. Mm -hmm. We're told that we're being a bad girl or being rude or being a bitch if Mm -hmm. we do those things. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating. That's really frustrating because someone outside of you is limiting you and that's a horrible feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I think... I think everybody's got a little bit of Rosa in yeah. their personalities, you know? Yeah. I love the um, bond that Rosa has with Jake. I love it too. It's like foundational. Yes. They met when they were, you know, learning how to be police officers, mm-hmm. you know, learning how to be people really, you know, in their 20s. Yeah. And so they bonded over, probably over how, I think for myself, I think Rosa was just enthralled by how good Jake was at everything that he tried because I Mm -hmm. bet he was like a really good street beat cop before he was a detective and I bet she knew immediately that he wanted to be a detective because that's what he's been dreaming of since he was a kid Mm -hmm. you know and I think there's something in her that admired that because she too had found her way to this thing that she wanted very badly to be very good at you know for other reasons but yeah and I think that that just bonded them and it's like a lifelong bond you know that you would have with somebody that lived through something like that with you that like forge you know like when you're forging your adulthood like that those friendships will never go away Mm -hmm. you might not talk to that person for like six months but when you do it's like right where you left it Mm -hmm. what's your favorite thing i mean rosa does a lot of kind of like destruct seemingly destructive things (laughs) but kind of not you know she just loses patience yes things sometimes yes and also i think it's funny when she'll like punch um Oh my boil gosh. or something I like love just kind of like what's your favorite thing that rose has done that you that you got to play oh gosh where you're like i would never normally do this oh man <laughs> so many things there's so many i mean i do like all the sort of semi-destructive things that she does that like- really are like get out of my way thing that's slowing me down mm-hmm. you know yeah, i don't know i mean i have really good memories of like the 
fire extinguisher race with Jake from the pilot Mm -hmm. because it was the pilot and it was like I'm sitting on a chair next to Andy Samberg and we have fire extinguishers in our hands and we're doing a scene like and it was hilarious and it was really fun yeah (laughs) yeah I don't know I mean I've gotten to do so many cool things with her the stunt stuff I think is some of my favorite stuff Mm -hmm. Um, having stunt doubles is really cool like because it really feels like you're in some kind of like action movie, which I would love to do someday, you know? Yeah. I think that that stuff has been really amazing. Some of my favorite stuff is like intimate scenes between two people where Rosa gets to not let her guard down, but like let the other person see more of who she really is. Mm -hmm. Like the scene in the car with, many scenes in cars actually, scene in the car with Amy where she's Amy's being very competitive with Rosa because Rosa's been offered a captain's position somewhere and and Rosa sort of says like we have to look out for each other stop being an idiot like I'm on your (laughs) side you know I loved that scene because it was so it was so real it was so Mm -hmm. like there's so many times in life where you just want to say women can be competitive with each other because we're pitted against each other Hmm. from the time we're small yes yeah and so it I just wish so many times that I could turn to someone that I feel is giving me competitive vibes and be like, hey, girl, I'm on your side. Mm-hmm. You don't got to do that that way. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't always. But I loved that scene. I also loved the scenes in the van at the end of last season with Charles, where he's sort of trying to get her to acquiesce to a surprise party that's happening. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. because she's so anxious about this thing that she just like, doesn't want to do at all and he's trying to convince her as a friend like it's gonna be all right it's gonna be fine you know and there's like there's glimpses of how much they actually really do know each other you know Charles knows like all these things about her Mm -hmm. you know like and vulnerable things that it doesn't bother Rosa that he knows like the stuff about Gilmore Girls (laughs) like I'm sure she wouldn't necessarily (laughs) like talk about that at work all the time but uh, for some reason it's totally normal with Charles you know yeah I love those scenes and like (laughs) Some of the scenes with Jake at his desk where I'm just like, just do it, man. Like, go get her. You want her. You mm-hmm. want her in your life this way. Do it. Mm-hmm. Stop being a big baby and just do it. Mm-hmm. I love that because well, that was so true to who she is, you know. Yeah. At the same time, yeah. I think like just like in regular life, it's so much easier to tell others around you like, do it, man. You're strong enough. You can do it. Nothing's going to happen. But when you're in the middle of it yourself, it's much more difficult to handle. And Rosa has a lot of trouble handling emotions, like her own emotions. She's mm-hmm. got problems with it, mm-hmm. for sure. And I think that that's going to be the exciting thing in seeing this season. Mm-hmm. In fact, like the next episode, I think that that's like one of the key elements of the very next episode that's going to air, like November 8th, I think. Hmm. I really like when she was like, throw down. Like, oh, yeah. Like how she has her... Um, her date. Her, her way of doing things, yeah, that she thinks is like, yeah, she's like, good watch idea. basketball, order pizza, bone down. Yeah, bone that's down. what she said. Yeah, because <laughs> like, why, why pussyfoot around it? Just let's just go. That is actually very me in some ways. I actually, I asked Dan on our first date because I, I liked him, and I was mm-hmm. like, well, I like him. I'm not gonna wait for him to ask me out. Like, why? Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna ask him out, and if he says no, then I know that he doesn't like me back. You know. That's very mature. Yeah. Actually. Maybe a little like. crazy, but, <laughs> but I did it. You know, we were kind of talking about this before we started, but I was interested in how do you keep balance in your life? Because I I know you have to, you know, be at work early. These are kind of, they are long hours. It's, it's funny because I know that Brooklyn Nine-Nine is one of the most um, balanced hour-wise where people can work and still have a life after yes. work and such. That's what I've heard. But there's still, it's a full day. Truly. Being there and being, you know, in hair and makeup early in the morning. Truly. How do you stay balanced? How do you take care of yourself? I mean, I have help. I ask for help. I mean, I have a therapist. I have a health coach. I rely on my friends a lot. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I struggle with it, actually. I struggle with feeling balanced. I mean, it would be great if I could just answer you like a sort of rote magazine article like, well, you've got to prioritize, blah, blah, blah. You know, like what what you read in magazines and you're like, God dang it, why can't my life be like that? But I really struggle with balance. I I don't think those are real. I don't think they are either. (laughs) I think they're like sort of, you know, magazine article answers. Yeah. The reality is that Some weeks are better than others. Some Mm -hmm. weeks I feel like, oh, great. Some days are better than others. I try not to isolate. 
because it can be really easy to do when you're busy and you just sort of go like I'm busy and stressed and no one understands and like I can't talk about this with anyone and I'm just gonna now I'm gonna go eat some feelings you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) like I try not to do that because I know that that's unhealthy and I know what happens if I go down that path. Mm -hmm. I try not to rely on drugs and alcohol Mm -hmm. because that can be a really easy, like, this will feel better. I'll feel better if I do this. But really, it's just hitting a pause button Mm -hmm. on the feelings. Mm -hmm. It's just muting it. It's not solving anything. Yeah, not working through the problem. Yeah. Or even, like, honoring your your right to think about the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, you're not because you're deciding that you're just going to like stop thinking about it for a minute, yeah. but it's still going to be there yeah. when you're done. Have you always asked for help or is this something no, that like you... it's new for sure. It's new for sure because I used to think like if I can't do it on my own, then I'm failing. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a failure if I can't handle this on my own. For a long time, I thought therapy was meant that I was a failure. I was crazy like if I needed therapy, like well, who goes to therapy, like crazy people with money. You know, and the reality is that like it would be great if everyone could talk yeah. to someone about their feelings. Yeah. You know, it would be really great. It'd be so much healthier. Mm-hmm. I remember going when I saw Inside Out in the theaters, I cried so much because I thought there's going to be an entire generation of kids that know how to express their feelings to people hmm. that can say like, right now I feel angry. It's not everything that I am. It's not all of who I am. Mm. But right now I feel this, mm-hmm. you know. Or right now I can feel angry and sad or sad and happy about this thing. I can have two things living inside me at once. It doesn't have to be one or the other, Mm -hmm. you know. I can feel very grateful for Brooklyn Nine-Nine and at the same time feel very anxious that now I have all these other things on my plate because of it. I can feel really grateful and wonderful about all sorts of stuff and still feel anxious. And that's just the reality of what it is. But talking to someone about it really helps and like I'm in recovery from an eating disorder and like having somebody help me through that Mm -hmm. is major for me having a health coach somebody that like I can talk to specifically about my relationship with food and like how it's never about the food it's all about like all all the other stuff that's going on in my life you know Hmm. it's not just about like these calories in and how much you're working out it's like no it's about like why did you feel like you had to come home and eat the entire contents of the fridge what's going on in your life that's making you feel that way you Mm -hmm. know like there's all sorts of stuff that like I ask for help with and I'm very lucky that like I have income that allows me to have you know to hire someone to talk to about food you know Mm -hmm. or my feelings like not everyone is so lucky but what we do have what everyone has accessible is friends Mm -hmm. you know and friends can be lifesavers in those situations lifesavers mm-hmm. because the more I think that you let people know that you are struggling with something the more you can just get close I, I I've read something or I watched something the other day that my friend Bonnie Bonnie Hernandez is a, like she's an amazing amazing person she's a social worker and she's also on the dance squad it's a great name so great like right that name. Mm-hmm. Um, and she she posted something the other day that was about addiction Hmm. And it said in in the course of the little video snippet, it says the opposite of addiction is connection. Hmm. It's a connection with other people. And like, and I thought like that goes for anything. It's like food or drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever it is that like you're using to like get out of your isolated feeling. It's like the minute that you sort of start sharing those feelings those feelings of like, I don't know if I can handle this. Mm-hmm. I feel like a monster. I feel like I feel like I'm never going to get to do the thing I want to do or I just I feel like no one understands me or I feel like my family hates me or whatever it is. The connection that you can create with friends is priceless because it can make you feel like I can do this. I can mm-hmm. live. I can live this life like mm-hmm. with all its problems and sort of anxiousness or depression or whatever. I can get through it because mm-hmm. there's people around me that – want me to get through it and that are telling me that it's going to be okay and they believe it so I can believe it too yeah and it sounds also like um like putting things in perspective like yes. that that's been so helpful for you like yes. instead of being feeling swallowed by yes, something because sometimes you just talk to someone about it like you like feel major self-hatred about something and then you talk to your friend about it and she'll be like girl you just ate a burger it's fine like yeah. <laughs> you're not a monster <laughs> like you're fine it's fine you'll you know you'll eat healthier for dinner or whatever whatever the yeah. issue is that you're particularly having 
talking to somebody else about it is like saying it out loud. It makes it just less yeah. crazy. It seems so big when it's rattling around in your brain. But when it comes yeah, out of your yeah. mouth, it's not as scary. Yeah. You know, it's like taking the power away from the, the monster. And like, why did we give that monster power in the first place? Right. Like, why did it? Why is it all of a sudden, you know, hanging so, over my head? Right. And like, why is it so strong? Why yeah. is it so strong? It's because we made it strong. It's because hmm. we believed it. Have you ever seen The Labyrinth? Yes. You know that part at the end where she says to Jared, she's like, you have no power over me. And like yeah. the whole world like falls apart. Yeah. I love that line. I love that because it's like, it's true. That whole thing was created because like her mind was in this place of like, he has the power. I don't. I have to follow his rules. I have to do the thing that he wants me to do. And ultimately it's not that, it's not that at all. It's just your brain. I like to say this about, about the eating disorder, especially it's like, she sounds just like me. Uh huh. Her voice sounds just like me. Yeah. So she sounds like she's telling the truth. Mm hmm. When she says hateful things to me or says, like, you can't handle this or you can't do this or you, you can't, you can't, you can't, she sounds true. Like, it sounds true because her voice sounds just like mine. But you the know? track record is false, mm -hmm. right? It's she's like, such a liar. Yeah. She's such a liar. Big she's, time. She's not, she's not telling me the truth at all. No. Yeah. There, there's no proof. No. No. <laughs> so then when that happens, do you just you know, redirect your thoughts. Yeah. In the last couple of years, I've, I've the other voice, the more positive voice. Yeah. It's like over in the corner going like, it's okay. You know, she's yeah. gotten louder and louder. <laughs> I think like, what is it? That sort of um, fable about like the, the two wolves inside you. Have you ever heard that? I don't know that I don't, one. I think I'm going to terribly misquote it, but it's like there are two wolves inside you and like one is the sort of like mean and hateful and nasty one and the other one is like the sort of the the calm and like loving one and they're only one can survive. And it's an old man, I think, telling his son. I think it might be like a Native American story or something. And the son's like, well, which one, which one lives? And the older man says, well, the one you feed, mm. right? So like feeding the voice that's like, Hey girl, you got this. Mm -hmm. You know, like the voice that sounds like what Melissa says to me like all the yes. time, you know, like yeah. the positive, the voice that's like your the voice of your friends basically, mm -hmm. the one that the voice that would never say anything nasty to you because you're wonderful and beautiful right. source of light and humanity, yes. you know? Yeah. That voice yeah. is she she can get louder and stronger, but you have to feed her, you have to listen to her, you have mm -hmm. to like and I think that the, when I do feel balanced, I am listening to that voice more. And I'm allowing that voice to say like, hey girl, maybe don't like cram your schedule full of appointments this week. Like maybe you should take the night to like spend with Dan and hang out with him. Mm -hmm. Or like, do you really need to work out again to like today? You worked out yesterday. You're going to have dance rehearsal tomorrow. You're doing great. You're really strong. Like It's okay. Yeah. You know, like listening to that voice creates balance in my life because she knows, she, your instinct knows like when you're overworked and over tired like, yeah like it's time for rest yeah you it's know, okay, and it's okay it's, to rest it's okay to rest you don't have to feel bad about resting because then you'll do a better job yeah later you mm -hmm. know yeah. yeah yeah that's a really really good note to end on oh, good <laughs> thank you so much you're so welcome colleen that was really fun it was like having lunch with a friend thank you stephanie for that compliment i will say the feeling is mutual if you'd like to see photos of Stephanie as Detective Rosa Diaz, or you'd like to see video of Hamilton the Musical or the LA Municipal Dance Squad, head to my website, ColleenLindell.com, where you can find links to these, as well as links to the Geffen Playhouse, where you can purchase your tickets to Outside Mollingar, or check out Theater Works USA. Thank you again, Stephanie. I had a blast talking with you. And thank you guys for listening. Your ears and your feedback mean the world to me. This episode was recorded on location in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles.